broadly, what is sex and what's the role of sex in evolution? Sex is a way of mixing up genes, right? So sexual reproduction means you get two organisms and they go like, basically, hey, I've got a bunch of harmful mutations. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but you've got a bunch of harmful mutations also. But our, our mutations might be a little different from each other. So if we mix our genes, right, at least some of our offspring might actually be even better than us or might have a lower mutation load than us or might have kind of subtly new and different and, and advantageous traits compared to us. So when I teach human sexuality, I always contrast like asexual reproduction, which is basically cloning yourself versus sexual reproduction, where you're mixing up your genes. Asexual reproduction is, is in a way very, very efficient in the short term. Like you can just flood the environment with copies of yourself. But if you're a complex organism like a vertebrate, you're going to go extinct pretty fast because um, mutations just keep accumulating and make, making you worse and worse at surviving and reproducing. So I talk a lot about what are the fundamental benefits of sex. It has to do with purge bad mutations, recombine good mutations, and try to stay one step ahead of pathogens and parasites and you know, viruses and bacteria that are evolving faster than a big organism can ever evolve. You know, for some reason, I didn't think that that was the case. Uh, I feel like this, this might be a, a missing piece of my knowledge here. So you're basically saying that sex, one of the major functions is error correction, because if you were just cloning yourself, you would just accumulate errors and you wouldn't have the error correction. Yeah. Huh. Okay. It's, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm ready to accept that because I thought that it was more like, maybe it's both, but I thought it was more like sex is purposefully introducing new variety. And so it actually is not trying to preserve your exact clone, but I guess maybe it's simultaneously doing both, right? It's simultaneously introducing mm -hmm. variation, but also fixing errors. Yeah, exactly. So you've got a kind of runaway error problem in an asexual species, and that's called Mueller's ratchet. It was talked about by Hans Mueller, a geneticist, like 100 years ago. Um, and sex is really, really good at both the error correction thing, maintaining the adaptive integrity of the organisms in your species, but it's also really good at recombining potentially useful new genetic variants. And so it kind of speeds up uh, adaptive evolution in that sense. And back when I was doing agent-based modeling in the early 90s, a lot of it was about what exactly are the benefits of sexual reproduction from a kind of almost like a machine learning perspective or a kind of mm -hmm. general optimization perspective. And then, you know, layered on top of that, you can, you can add the mate choice dimension, right? Which is, okay, if you're going to recombine your genes with, with some other organism to produce offspring, ah, there's a decision element here. Who are you going to recombine your genes with? Right. That's mate choice. So, yeah. um, that has also been a major theme in, in my whole kind of research career is trying to figure out mate choice for good genes, right? Or mate choice for genetic variety. And I view that not just in terms of like, oh, humans trying to find like a good marriage partner, but in a much broader kind of optimization of the evolutionary process kind of, kind of view. Yeah, that's actually very interesting. Uh, so when you're just changing the gene pool by having organisms dying, there's a certain amount of like average bits per generation that you can do, which is pretty slow. Mm -hmm. But then when you have mate choice, if the mate choice is sufficiently selective, and if there's sufficiently few times when people just have to settle, like, nope, every organism just has, it's like musical chairs, everybody's eventually getting laid, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. Mm -hmm. It seems like you can be selective and maybe a 10th, like a 10th of the males will get all the women, for example. So there's like a lot of selection potentially uh, on males, maybe, just, I'm exaggerating, but like, my point is here that the amount of genetic information per generation can potentially like double or triple, I guess, if there's enough sexual selection, correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a real supercharger of evolution. And Darwin kind of realized this way back in the 1870s. Like his book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, something like seven or 800 pages, most of which was about mate choice for kind of good genes among, he went through insects, amphibians, uh, reptiles, birds, mammals, and finally got to humans, but he documented enormous amounts of 
of evidence that like even insects are doing selective mate choice because it pays. Um, it, it makes you have offspring that are better and it, it accelerates the evolutionary process. Okay. So you've written on a lot of different aspects of sex. You've written about sexual encounters, how people select mates, how marketing is related to sex, how virtue signaling is related to sex, how people become more sexually attractive, how human traits are products of sexual selection. And this could easily be a, a multi-hour interview just on all the different sex stuff. Uh, we're probably going to skip past uh, most of the subtlety there and just focus a little bit on the part that's most interesting to me, which is like the courtship advice for single guys and gals, right? Because you've also spent a lot of time on that. Yeah, way back, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, I met some of the... Um... The people in the kind of manosphere and the pickup artists, particularly my friend uh, Eben Pagan, who who had kind of stage name David D'Angelo, and he gave, I thought, pretty good dating advice, actually, to young men. Um, but I noticed that a lot of the, the dating gurus weren't really tuned into the deeper aspects of evolutionary psychology. So they could often say, here's a tactic that I guess seems to work if you're doing your like going out and you're doing your, your day game or you're trying to find people online or whatever, but they couldn't explain why it works. And that is uh, challenging for a lot of young men because they're like, why am I doing this? The problem is it creates resentment against women, right? And you see this in the manosphere, massive degrees of misogyny and contempt for women. Like, oh, they're just focused on these superficial traits and they're ignoring these other traits and, and that sucks and they're stupid. One thing that Tucker Max and I wanted to do in, in writing the mate book was try to think in this kind of evolutionary psychology perspective, why did women evolve these particular preferences? Why do they want these things? If you understand that, then number one, you'll get better at, at leveling yourself up and developing these traits and these capacities and competencies and talents. But also, you'll respect women more, right? You'll see their views, hopefully, as more legitimate. You'll be able to take their point of view. So nobody would have necessarily accused Tucker Max of being like a feminist, but the, the point of the mate book really was try to teach young men the validity of a lot of these female preferences and then practical strategies for kind of making yourself a better guy who fits those preferences more more effectively. Mm -hmm. 